On October 14, 1993, Luxor, a new hotel casino in Las Vegas, opened its doors. Luxor is probably the most spectacular architectural statement in the world today. It's a destination, really. It's the latest and most high-tech evolution of a combination between entertainment and gaming. It's like a, a planet. It's really phenomenal. I mean, it was amazing when we walked up. We just um, couldn't believe what we saw. This is an opportunity of a lifetime to work on the Luxor project because I think it's a real entertainment breakthrough. The story of Luxor begins with Circus Circus Enterprises, the company that runs the Circus Circus Casino, built in 1968 on the Las Vegas Strip. Unlike casinos featuring high-stakes gambling and star-studded entertainment, the idea includes circus acts and a midway where parents can bring their kids. Circus Circus was acquired in 1974 by William G. Bennett, its current chief executive officer. Over the years, Mr. Bennett developed many other properties, including Excalibur, a King Arthur-themed castle with over 4,000 rooms. In 1991, the company announced the building of Luxor on a 47-acre site adjacent to Excalibur. Over here, we have a, a lot of space. Luxor began by bringing together the leading talents in hotel, casino, management and design, architecture, and high-tech special effects attractions. It starts with a vision, but the vision is somewhat vague. And what happens is that you then seek out the best and the brightest of all you can find, and you have intense brainstorm sessions, and out of that comes ideas. It's not ice yet. Everybody has future pictures, Doug. Bill Paulos is Luxor's general manager, responsible for overseeing every aspect of the project. How can we depict the good future that, of your story to where it's, it's friendly and warm and, and, and where people leave on a high? When you get that big payoff scene at the end. Douglas Trumbull, world-renowned for the Back to the Future ride and the special effects for Close Encounters of the Third Kind, created the high-tech attractions. This is the first time that anybody's ever said to me, you could design the whole thing. And not only the concept of the shows and the production of the shows, but the design of the theaters themselves. This is the big concrete pad that's on the special piers for the motion page, right? right? Veldon Simpson is the architect. His idea to build a pyramid grew from a five-story hotel to a 30-story gaming and entertainment complex. I think we've reached the point where architecture now becomes a very important element in casino hotel work, and that's what makes these projects so exciting. Ground is broken in April 1992, and Luxor begins to rise in the Las Vegas desert. Over 150 contractors and 3,500 workers are employed to build the grand scale structure. I think I have the same feeling about uh, this project that everybody on this job has. From me to the contractors, all the way down to the painters and the drywallers and everybody out there are just delighted to be working on this job. What this, am I hanging? Is this fire alarm? It's a door, it's a door speaker that's going to make a creaking sound when the door opens. I'm a wireman. The most interesting thing outside of the cranes outside they were awful high uh will probably be these theaters when we have the stage built and push the pyramid up to it we we'll frame out this whole unique different complex you ain't never going to build a pyramid again the idea of a pyramid inspired douglas trumbull and his production designer bob taylor to create all the thematic elements for the luxor attractions from the architecture and decor of the theaters to the story that is the basis for the attraction films. We wanted to create some place for you to go, some place to have an adventure, some place that we've never seen before. And in designing the architectural motif and configuration of this pre-Egyptian civilization, our idea was that everything you've ever seen in Egypt is a poor facsimile of what this high-technology civilization developed. 
and that they lived in a world where gravity was no longer an issue and they built vehicles that could levitate so we've been able to give this world a very uh, spectacular and unusual look in the spring of 1993 the attraction level begins to take shape and the pyramid reaches a height of 200 feet the building will boast the largest atrium in the world with elevators that run diagonally up the four corners Three theaters are constructed to house the main attractions, a trilogy of adventures through the past, present, and future. The entrance to the attraction level is modeled to look like a vast archaeological dig. This will be a large ramp that goes down into the casino, and over on this side is a large pond of water, and then there's a big hanging bridge that goes across here, and that's one of the scenes that goes into the past theater. And this whole thing will be covered with fog. We'll have fog just falling off of these rocks and down into this pond of water. At the Trumbull Company in Lenox, Massachusetts, production on the attractions is in progress, including developing the prototype for the motion base that will carry the audience through an adventure called In Search of the Obelisk. Basically, it's a 15-passenger uh, vehicle. The screen is 25 feet across, somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 feet high. You project the image throughout the whole 180 degrees of the uh, screen. This is like a 5,000 pound steel structure under here with a tremendous hydraulics. This thing really has a tremendous amount of power. I mean, it's really gonna whip people around, you know. It's, it's amazing how strong it is. The computer controlled theater is programmed to move synchronously with the action and characters in the film. By bringing all those things together, you feel like you're inside the movie. You're not just looking at the movie, you're in the movie, and you're one of the characters in the movie. Creating the films for the attractions begins in the image engineering department where computers aid in designing models and sets and pre-visualize how the camera will move through them. This is a fight sequence from the puzzle room shot and we're flying this vehicle that's kind of flying out of control because there's a fight going on on the vehicle so nobody's actually driving. So we're just narrowly missing crashing into all these things and we crash into this thing and we crash into this thing. Once complete, the design work is used as a blueprint to build the models in the model shop. One of the ways we get people to think models are real is by jamming as much detail onto them as possible in as many different ways as we can. We've created well over a hundred very detailed buildings and hundreds and hundreds of other less detailed, smaller scale buildings, all of which are designed as a theoretical version of the future. A laser cam is a cutting device used to create fine detail and hieroglyphics in the models. We created this architectural style that we call Crypto-Egypto, which was to take architectural motifs of the Egyptians and sort of modernize them and build them out of sophisticated materials so they didn't look handmade. To further the believability of the sets, the models must be carefully lit. Uh, what it boils down to is just as coming up with an idea, coming up with a concept for, uh, for what each miniature should look like. Uh, you know, what time of day are we working at? What kind of colors are we talking about? Whether or not this should really look real or it should be a, a fantasy. One of the sets actually reached above a thousand lights, and most of those were all miniature lights. Filming is done with custom-built, computer-controlled cameras. Because we're using motion control for a lot of our shots, most of the, uh, the camera mounts, for instance, that we're building are robotically operated rather than manually operated because they have to be repeatable. That requires uh, quite, uh, quite a bit of precision in terms of building everything from the actuation system to the guides that the cameras themselves will ride along. Before filming, the studio is filled with smoke maintained at an exact level to create atmosphere. In the finished shot of the doomed future city, the smoke adds a feeling of depth and realism. While filming the miniatures continues, work on a much larger scale also continues in Las Vegas. In August, the giant pyramid is capped, and the main entrance, or port cochere, has taken shape in the form of a giant sphinx. We found that the actual sphinx was too small to in scale against this big pyramid, so we had to enlarge the thing to about 50% bigger than it actually is. 
At its apex, Luxor will feature the world's most powerful beam of light. No one has ever turned a light on this bright. It is several, several billion foot candles. We're not sure <laughs> what it's going to do when we turn it on. Inside, workers complete canals for a water journey along the Nile River. You'll leave the registration desk, get on the uh, boat, and the Nile River will transfer you to the elevator cores that are in the four corners of the pyramid. We're traveling from the Temple of Isis, which is about 30 BC, all the way back to 4000 BC. It's an education. Towards you a little bit. Work on the attractions continues in one of the most intricate miniature sets, the Puzzle Room, with over 500 pieces that form a maze going off in every direction. Uh, Kerry, could you speed the uh, rig up to 10 frames a second? Doug Smith, whose work includes shooting special effects for Star Wars, programs the intricate camera moves. Right. Every time the camera pans, it's sliding and compensating. In the simulator ride, the audience will feel as though they're riding through the set from the camera's point of view, so the motion must be carefully worked out and refined. Will it be uh, too convenient for this thing to blast back this far and happen to line up with the next shot? Well, I think what it should do is that, no, it shouldn't. I think it should come, it should get blasted back into the zone and then sort of have to hover a little bit to sort of get our bearings here and then sort of settle into this shot. Another set was built with the perspective forced to create the illusion of a giant chasm as the camera moves in to reveal an altar holding the sacred obelisk. The actors and anti-gravitational vehicles will be filmed and added later as a special effect. A temporary paper cutout tells the camera operator where the action will be. In the unfinished atrium, the attraction theaters look more like miniatures than seven-story buildings. Inside, Douglas Trumbull surveys the future theater before installation of the 70-foot tall screen. Did you talk to Dennis about this, uh, the whole idea of changing this from a gold crypto-egypto to a uh, sort of gunmetal oh, yes. color? The interiors of the attraction pre-show areas are carefully painted to complete the illusion of entering the archaeological dig. While at the Trumbull Company, full-scale sets are being finished to shoot scenes of the actors. The monolev, one of many full-scale props to be used in the live-action filming, is the anti-gravitational vehicle driven by the hero of the story. Vroom, vroom. Can I see this in book, Rogers? <laughs> Originally, it was going to be a static model, nothing moved. For example, the steering forks, the two pieces sitting up and down right now, uh, those were statically in one position and they decided at one point they wanted them spring-loaded to pivot. Spring-loaded strong enough to force, during the fight scene, to force a guy in mid-air off the front of it. The action on the monolev is filmed in front of a blue screen and later combined with the miniature photography. The future attraction features a pod that transports the characters in the story through time. The two characters are very strong. It's Karina Walensky and Mac McPherson. And they're both sort of 90s kind of people. They're both a little physical, yet intellectual. So there's a lot of interaction, a lot of interplay, and there's a, we have a really great dynamic. At first, you see the pyramid, you know, it's quite far away. Co-director Arish Faizi has the difficult task of helping the actors visualize and react to special effects that will be added much later on. Music. Flying space balls all around you, turning the corner, and you see the pyramid in the distance. It is these scenes and the actors' performances that form the backbone of the story. I think the, the integrity of the story is the core. That's the one thing that the audience sees and perceives. They don't see the technology. They don't know what hell we went through to make that effect or that illusion. Going in on her, that's 15 seconds. They just want to know who's going to save who and who's the hero and who's the bad guy and what are the conflicts going on. Millions of people are watching. Instead of going all the way down when I do that, it'll be quicker if you go just like, like this and then go. I there bring you. There you go. That'll work better. There's that's a struggle exactly. between Osiris and Karina. There any trumpets. When Osiris grabs the obelisk from Karina, it burns his hands, and he goes, ah, and knocks me off the altar. Ah! Mark! Then they're going to pick up Karina in action through the fall off this thousand-foot tower, and they're doing that on a flying harness. And once Karina regains her balance, she reaches out for Mac and lands on her feet. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
By September, landscaping at Luxor is well underway, including planting 550 palm trees and sodding the 47-acre site. This uh, is called the front water feature. It consists of uh, over 100 fountains that are all computerized. Laser beams come out of the Sphinx's eyes and shoot down onto the water. It also consists of a 60-foot high screen of water, which we project graphics on, and laser beams complement that. The Egyptian motif comes to life in friezes of Egyptian scenes at Luxor's main entrance. The hotel requires enough carpeting to cover 34 football fields. Over 11,000 square yards of it are in the casino alone. From spaceships with contrails to elaborate backgrounds which seem to go on for miles, computers help to create some of the most realistic special effects in the Luxor attractions. 27 and 29, Eileen needs to know... In Lenox, Massachusetts, artists and technicians at the Kleiser Walzak Company created the computer-generated images. Even with state-of-the-art technology, only a few seconds of film same, per week can day. be produced. For Luxor, there were hundreds of scenes and huge amounts of data to manage. One of the most impressive effects, the Guardian, began as a sculpture. A grid was mapped onto it and then programmed, allowing a realistic computer-generated model to be animated and mixed with other special effects. I think we should leave. Kleiser Walzak animators also designed and created all the flying vehicles in the Luxor attractions. We built a number of different types. This is the BMW, the other we called Space Miata. Notice we've got our uh, space taxi here. These were little spheres used to test different color combinations for the cars. And uh, Doug Trumbull saw the test and liked them so much that uh, they're now going to be in the film. There's a huge explosion that happens right in front of us. Many shots, including an explosion only a few seconds long, required layers of animation and took months to produce. And you can see all the pieces of the monolith start to fly apart, so we're going to build this up in layers. The first piece comes right past our right ear, and then the second one comes right past our left ear. What you see here is a lot of little polygons that have fire put on top of them. And what's kind of magical about this is when you put all these layers together, although one layer in itself may not look totally realistic, it creates this, this complete illusion for people that there's this, this explosion going on. The skies tumble over. 3D images were created for the attraction called Luxor Live. Whoa. The images are produced on two films and resolved by wearing special glasses, which seem to make them jump off the screen. You gotta try this. One of the most striking images, the crystal dancers, used motion scanned from real performers to make the movement seem highly realistic. In one of the near-complete attraction theaters, Douglas Trumbull, Arish Faizi, and sound designer Leslie Schatz work on another important element, the 8-track digital soundtrack. 14 should be as loud as you can make it. Yeah. That's the one place where I'd like yeah. to feel that sub-audible pop, you know, just right. a punk white noise. Using a rough version of the film, layers of sound effects, music, and dialogue are mixed together. It starts coming in here. A full symphony orchestra and chorus provide the music. Gotcha! Oh. 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 Miss me? Oh, you bet. The last step in finishing the attraction films is putting together the hundreds of shots of actors, models, and the computer-generated images. This is digital compositing. This is where we combine all the images that we've shot and put them out to film. Special effects supervisor Joel Heinick was present at all stages of the project to ensure that the hundreds of shots were photographed to specific technical standards. 30 even. It's not magic, you know. One of the things that Surge has to tackle with here is, he is handling uh, huge amounts of data. Because each one of these images is made up of about 90 megabytes of right, data, which is, you know, will usually fill up someone's PC, their whole disk, one image here. Uh, Gotta see it in there moving, Serge. Okay. Sure. It's the kind of leading edge right now of, like, film technology. A lot of this yeah, stuff is custom-made. For instance, I've written most of the software that is 
being used uh, to do this. This is just now becoming possible. Like in this, just this year, really, really aspire to do a film of this complexity. As construction on the hotel nears completion, over 4,500 employees begin work. Tour guides rehearse their scripts. Good morning, my name is Cricket. I'll be taking you on the archaeological tour of the Nile. We are going on a mysterious journey down along the Nile River. We'll be going through eight tunnels down into the casino and around. The casino finishes setting up 2,500 slot machines, 87 table games, and poker and kino rooms. All right, can I have a status on Millennium now? I cannot find either power cord for the two main card readers. What about the back of Papyrus? The hotel readies its seven restaurants and three gift shops. Luxor's 2,500 rooms await the arrival of the hotel's first guests. Registration makes arrangements to receive visitors. It's chaos, but it's wonderful. <laughs> Maybe we check in there. And in preparation for the grand opening party, artists create a sphinx made of 35 tons of ice. Grand opening night begins as performers from Luxor's dinner show, Winds of the Gods, greet guests at the front entrance. I haven't quite seen the whole film yet, so I'm looking forward to it. On behalf of all Nevadans, I would like to extend our congratulations Thank you, Circus, for bringing Egypt to the desert and creating an, an oasis of entertainment. Well, 25 years after Circus Circus's inception, William G. Bennett flips a symbolic switch to turn on Luxor's light beam. If you guys are ready, I will now flip a switch and you will see some of the most amazing effects you've ever seen in your life. At 6.45 p.m. on October 14, 1993, the world's most powerful beam of light permanently changes the Las Vegas skyline, signifying Luxor's official grand opening. And the present was wonderful and spectacular. The 3D looks great. Everybody runs into me and says, aren't you that visionary archaeologist? I get that all the time now. That's because Bill takes risks. Yeah. You know, look at this. <laughs> On October 15th, Luxor invites the public to the largest atrium in the world to get on board the reed boats for the Nile River journey. In the tomb of, yes, King Tut. The wall shows the Visit a state-of-the-art video arcade. Enjoy the 100,000 square foot casino and experience the attractions for the first time. Look in the cavern we discovered yesterday. The simulator ride is the first part of the trilogy. In it, Mac hitches the audience to his monolev, pulling them into the secret underground excavation to find Karina and the sacred obelisk. There's just like this big old blue thing. It shoots these lasers out of its eyes. I was like, you know, feeling like I'm going to fall, so I have to hold tight. It went good. She started screaming. And yeah, but I... I quieted down then. I was screaming because it was fun. Blood pressure went up, the uh, heartbeat went up. It was, it was intense. Felt like I was zooming through time and entering uncharted areas. And yeah, we're trying to rescue this girl in there. Karina! Did you succeed in rescuing the girl? Yeah, we did. But we got shot by the lasers. Uh -huh. But that brought us back to the present. The second part of the trilogy, Luxor Live, is a parody of television talk shows that makes fun of Mac and Karina's occult experiences. He's trying to discredit my discovery by calling it a hoax or the occult and trying Magic, to keep it a secret. Magic, occult, whatever word you want to use, it's all baloney. But you know it's something more than that. That's it mixes live actors with film and video images, culminating with spectacular 3D special effects as the audience shares Karina's discovery of the true meaning of the obelisk. 
The final attraction is a trip into the future in the theater of time, where Mac, Karina, and the audience experience visions of the future in a time machine. Technology, experiences, architecture, there's a lot of risk involved in being the first to do something. I never believed the circus would buy off on a true pyramid that dealt with an atrium casino. That's why I think Luxor is so important because it sets a whole new standard. I mean, there's nothing like it in the world, absolutely nothing like it. I think this is a monumental achievement to have done all this in 18 months. This was a trailer park 18 months ago, and now facing the fact that this place is gonna be full of people forever. You know, it will never close. This place is open 24 hours a day. Uh, it's a living thing.